You're listening to the Higher Ideas Podcast, where ideas grow. Connect on Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, or higherideas.net. Now here's your host, I. Hello, fellow human, and welcome back to the Higher Ideas Podcast. So today I'd like to continue exploring psychedelics with you. I mean, I'm sure you're getting a sense by now of how complex and deep um, this subject is. There's just so much to say and explore about this thing, psychedelics, and the psychedelic experience. But you know what? I'll tell you a little secret. These psychedelic episodes are getting massive listens online. So I'm assuming most of you listening are actually happy to hear about this stuff. And today what we're going to be exploring about psychedelics is one of its great mysteries. And of its great mysteries, to be honest, I think it's one of its most mundane. It's one of its most everyday, yeah, so what, kind of effects that after a while, uh, you just kind of accept and stop being amazed by. But it really is amazing. And that thing is this. Psychicness. I'm talking about psychic communication between one person and another person, with the help of psychedelics. For those of you who have heard the paranormal episode, uh, episode number 33, especially if you've heard the original unedited version, um, you will know that I'm a person who in life has experienced quite a lot of crazy paranormal things. And based on these experiences, I, a long time ago, have known that the human mind has this potential to be psychic. We really do seem to be connected on some level, and I'm sure that science is catching up right now. I know that quantum physics starts to touch on a lot of this paranormal kind of uh, behavior. It seems to be able to maybe explain what's going on there, because on some level we are all connected through some kind of network, some kind of matrix of, of, of interrelation. So it really isn't that crazy, especially now that we have cell phones and know about wireless communication, we're getting closer and closer to realizing that this may be actually true, that we have some kind of wireless communication between our minds that we're not normally aware of. But of course, being a rational, scientific thinker, I know that there are people out there who may have not experienced things like this before and may be raising an eyebrow. So, let's do a little experiment. I want to tell you about a dream I had some time ago. I was in the living room of my old apartment building, and the door to my bedroom was closed. And for whatever reason, at some point in the dream, I wanted to go to my room. So I walk over to the door, I open the door, and behind the door... dot, dot, dot. Now, I would like you to tell me What do you think was behind the door? Now I'm going to give you the whole episode to think about it, okay? I'm going to bring this up again later. I'm going to give you the whole episode to come up with some kind of idea. What was behind the door when I opened it in this dream? But in the meantime, I'd like to tell you about, I think, what was my first run-in with psychicness through psychedelics. Now this was very early on in my experiences. This was maybe my... Actually, it was my second, my second mushroom experience many years ago. In episode number 37, I told you about my first experience, which was by myself at a very low dose. For this second experience, I wanted to try a full dose, but I was still not sure how it was going to affect me, how a full dose would be different from a light dose, so I asked a very close friend to watch over me, and just to make sure uh, nothing goes wrong. So there he was, watching over me, And I had my experience. I think I had two, two and a half grams of mushrooms in this particular occasion. I had my whole experience. I had all of my visions, and it went great. But the interesting thing happened when I came out of it. It takes a few hours to really come back to yourself completely after an experience like this. But, you know, for a while there, you're able to speak and function, and and, and you're basically back. Um, A little floaty, but you're back. So I had come back from this experience, and I was telling my friend, you know, about the different visions that I had, the different lessons that I learned. After speaking all those things and being quiet for a minute, I realized I was actually pretty tired. So 
I had kind of stopped talking, and I ended up falling asleep. And, you know, it was late by this point, so my friends also ended up falling asleep. And we slept for maybe, I don't know, an hour, had a little nap. Now, as I slept, I had a dream. And in that dream, I was in some kind of school building in the hallways, you know, with a lot of lockers and a shiny floor and, you know, doors with glass panels at each end of the hall and uh, classroom doors all along the way. Um, and I was trapped in a dead end. And I was being trapped in that dead end by a tiger. Now, this tiger was menacing. It was a big-ass tiger. And he was closing in on me slowly. He was right in front of me, basically. And he was slowly tiptoeing closer, looking at me, just waiting to strike. And I was against the wall, just, oh, God, how do I get out of this, right? And I ended up waking up, because it was kind of scary. And that's when I noticed, hey, uh, you fell asleep too, huh? And he said, oh, yeah, I'm tired. So I asked him if he had any dreams. And he said, oh, yeah, you were in my dream. And I thought, oh, okay, cool, what was it? And he says, you were in a hallway, and you were stuck in the corner, and there was a tiger walking up on you. And I was around the corner, watching from behind the tiger. And I didn't know how to help you. And that blew my freaking mind. That blew my mind. Because actually, we compared notes, and he was in the same hallway in my dream. The corner he was uh, standing just around was in my dream. There was a hall going sideways and away, uh, just behind the tiger, so there was a corner there. And that's where my friend was, peeking around and seeing this tiger creeping up on me. Now think about that for a second. Even if you're a rational scientific thinker, like I am, how do you explain that? How do you explain that coincidence? That is unexplainable by coincidence. That is too much. That's too much. That is exactly what I'm talking about here. This kind, this kind of matchup between two people that can only mean that they were both sharing a completely internal mental experience. That friend of mine was in my dream. And what does that say about dreams? That says that dreams on some level are a real, concrete place that other people can enter. Isn't that crazy? And what does that say about thoughts? That says that thoughts also have some kind of concreteness to them on a level that can be shared. It's not just a strange cloud of intangible things going on in your head, It is on some plane that we can share in the right circumstances. Now, there are people who are born, allegedly, with this ability all the time. Or maybe by accident, as has happened to me in my own life. I've had moments where I have had this glimpse into psychicness, but I've never been able to control it. So it was really interesting to realize that, for some reason, after I used the psychedelic Somehow he was able to come into my dream. Just from being around me, there really seems to be some loosening up of the barriers between people that happens through psychedelics. And what was really, to me, the most fascinating about that particular case is that he didn't need to have any inside his system to participate. Just me being released from ego somehow gave him that ability to come into my dream. Isn't that insane? Isn't that fascinating? I mean, I think that is absolutely fascinating. I don't know if anyone else out there is excited by this, but how do you just walk away from that and forget it? Or just walk away from it and go, eh, that doesn't mean anything. That means everything. That means something huge. Really take a moment to digest what that means. I'm not lying. This story is true. I swear to you that every story I ever share on this podcast is true. I'm not here to lie, I'm here to share amazing truths about life and the universe and reality and the self. And that's a huge one. Psychicness can happen through psychedelics, and even without psychedelics. But the amazing thing is, psychedelics seem to really help it happen. And that opens up the gates to studying it. Isn't that amazing? 
in my life, all of the strange, paranormal, impossible things that I experienced would happen randomly. I didn't seem to have any control over it, even when I did them myself. I didn't seem to be able to reproduce it. I didn't seem to know what the buttons were that were pressed that allowed this moment to happen. But it seems that with psychedelics, when it comes to psychicness, it can easily just be summoned. It can be made to happen. It can be opened up and allowed. So anyway, maybe that story isn't enough. Maybe that story still sounds like coincidence to you. Well, let me give you more. Because that isn't the only time I've experienced psychicness through psychedelics. In May of 2013, I went to the Amazon jungle to try one of the most powerful psychedelics in the world, known as ayahuasca. This is a psychedelic of the jungle people. And I've told you in the past that certain people spend their entire lives working with psychedelics, getting to know the experience, helping other people manage the experience. They're like facilitators, and they're like jungle guides that guide you through the jungle of a specific psychedelic. They get to know that landscape, and they get to guide you through. Now, these figures uh, go by many names, depending on which culture they're in. But in general, on the internet, on the global scene, we refer to them as shamans. Whether that's an accurate term or not, that's the term that has stuck. Shamans. And when I went to Peru, of course, I went there to meet a shaman. An ayahuasca shaman, who would administer ayahuasca to me and guide me through the experience. Now, over time, I would come to call this man simply Maestro, because he is a Maestro Curandero. Um, a master healer. And out of respect, I would just call him Maestro. And I'm introducing Maestro here for the first time. In this book I've written, it's basically a lot about me and Maestro and the insane experience I had that week. But I want to just give you a taste of the experiences I've had with Maestro that convince me completely that Maestro is psychic. Now, I hadn't experienced any more psychicness through psychedelics at this point because I had been journeying by myself. But here, in Peru, it was just him and me. Uh, I was very fortunate that just through timing, when I was there, there was no one else there. And it was just him and me in these uh, ceremonies we would hold where we would both take this psychedelic ayahuasca and I would quietly have my journey while he would be off to the side, um, doing his own thing, somehow watching over me in the pitch black. Now, this is what I want you to understand. It was pitch black uh, when I was there. There was no moon, there were no stars. It was absolutely black. When you opened your eyes, you couldn't see a thing unless you had a light on. In my first ritual, I had a lot of trouble. I had a lot of trouble. I would have a lot of fears that were coming up. And once in a while, I would find myself opening my eyes and wondering, uh, should I ask him for light? Should I ask him for a little break? Because I'm starting to get freaked out. And the thing is, within seconds of opening my eyes and wondering that, I would hear him off on the side and say my name. And he'd ask, you okay? Isn't that weird? When it happens once, oh, maybe it's a coincidence. When it happens twice... Maybe it's a coincidence. When it happens five times? Yeah, maybe. Maybe it's a coincidence. When it happens ten times? It, it happened over the two different years that I visited him. Every single time. I lost my resolve. Started to become unstable. Started to lose myself in fear. And open my eyes in perfect blackness. Wondering if I should say something, if I should leave the room. He would speak up and call my name and ask me if I'm okay. Only when that was happening. Never when I was quietly in my thing. So I very quickly started to wonder, man, is this guy somehow aware of my internal state without seeing me, without hearing me? I mean, you have to also understand that there's insect noise absolutely demolishing your sense of hearing. So he couldn't hear me open my eyes. He couldn't hear my breathing shift. 
He couldn't see my eyes opening. There is no way for this man to know that I was having a hesitant moment, but he would always know. So that right there is a kind of sensitivity to the, at least to the emotions of another person that he proved to me over time. As I said, over two separate years that I visited him, every time we had a session together, he would constantly know when I was destabilizing. And in fact, he was so good at this sense that there were times where I felt I needed to leave the environment because I felt I was disturbing him with my inner chatter, with my inner instability moments, that, that my struggles, my inner struggles. Um, and I knew he could hear it. I knew he could feel it. And I would think, I gotta get out of here because I'm, I'm, I'm disappointing him. This is a man I respect so much. Anyway, and in fact, yeah, he would stop these ceremonies when I would destabilize because he couldn't continue because of me. <laughs> because of me. If I would get too out of it in a group ceremony, he couldn't work on other people, I guess, because I was too loud, quote-unquote, with my internal thrashing. And so he would just wrap the whole thing up and go, all right, I'm going to go to bed, and he'd just leave us alone. So I am absolutely convinced, even just from that, that this man, somehow, through his lifetime of work with psychedelics, has developed the ability to monitor people to the, to the point that I could bother him without saying anything, without making a sound, just from my internal crisis it would throw the whole thing off. Now, the second time I visited him, on year two, I had a whole bunch of questions for him because I had written my book and there were so many mysteries that were being highlighted in that book that I wanted some answers. And one of the first things I asked him that second year was, Maestro, can you see other people's visions? And he said, yes. He nodded. But then he put his finger up to his mouth, as if to say, but I don't say anything. So he himself uh, confirmed to me that he can monitor what's going on in other people during these ayahuasca group sessions, which is amazing. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that an amazing piece of human potential that is being nurtured and, and cultivated through work in psychedelics? I'm talking about human evolution here. This is huge. And everyone knows about it. It's so weird. It's this open secret. It's, to me, this massive, explosive deal that should be studied and, and should, be, should be celebrated. But it's kept quiet because it's weird. Because, I don't know, is it because it's weird? Or is it because people are trying to keep it to themselves, trying to keep power to themselves? I don't know. But personally, I don't care about that game. I just want to tell people about it. So, you could say that's subtle, even though to me, I have to admit that scientifically that's significant. If every single time I have a certain emotional state in this case, getting scared, starting to destabilize, wanting to ask for help. If every time I reach that state silently, the man reacts within seconds and asks me if I'm okay, clearly he knows I'm not okay. Once, maybe luck. Dozens of times, over two separate years, no. The man knows. The man can see what's going on inside you. It's insane, but it's true. So, maybe that doesn't convince you. Now, I want to bring back our little experiment. On year two, when I visited him again, I ended up sleeping at his home for two nights, uh, because I was staying for two weeks, and I was assisting him at his camp. In between the two weeks, we had a weekend at his home. And on one of those nights, I happened to have a very, very intense dream. Now, do you remember the experiment from earlier, when I told you about a dream? where I opened a door. So I'm going to give you a moment right now to think about your guess. What's behind the door when I open it? Okay. All right. 
Well, I had this dream that I was in the living room of my apartment. And I opened the door to my particular bedroom to go in there for something. But when I opened that door, there was nothing but black. It was a solid wall of black, but it wasn't a wall. It was like a universe of black. It was a portal into nothing but black. And out of this black doorway, there was this wind blowing on me from in there, this howling gale, just... And in that blackness, I could hear at least three demonic beast-like growls, all sorts of threatening animal sounds. It was the most chilling dream that just froze me. Evil in there. It was pure evil. And I woke up, of course, because it was terrifying. And in fact, it took me maybe 15 minutes to calm down before going back to sleep, because it actually really shook me. And I I, I was stuck wondering, um, what does that mean? What does that dream mean? Is there... A black doorway inside of me that needs to be, um, you know, cleared out? Does that mean there's still evil back in my apartment? Uh, you know, I don't know. And eventually I went back to sleep. Now here's where it gets interesting. The next morning, I'm having a morning chat with Maestro, talking about all kinds of things. And then I think about the dream and I go, oh, Maestro, I had a dream last night. And he's like, mm-hmm, just listening. And I tell him, there was a door, and when I opened it, he interrupts me. Toda negra, all black, with a smile on his face. Can you believe it? I couldn't. How the hell can he know that? Out of all of the things, I just did the experiment with you. Out of all of the millions and billions of things that could have been behind that door, When someone is telling you that story, how did he know that it was solid black? And he knew exactly what I was talking about. I kept describing it to him, and I said there was wind, and there was howling, and he was just nodding, yeah, yeah, as if he knew that door. And I just... (laughs) So many times this man has made me just be at a loss for words. How the hell is this possible? And after I shook it off, like so many other moments that he he has blindsided me with, I then had to ask him, okay, well, what what does it mean? And he said it meant negative energy releasing inside of me. I wasn't convinced by that, because I really had a feeling that it meant there was still something, because I didn't win. You see, that dream, I retreated, I woke up. I felt like it was a failure. And so I asked him, what would you have done? And then he just made this gesture of parting the way with his arms and walking in, as if, get out of my way, I'm walking in. And that, you know, really impressed me because, oh man, that was really a terrifying door. And even if I knew it was a dream, I probably would still be scared to walk into there. That was pure evil in there. And this man, according to him, would have just walked in, said, get the hell out of my way, evil, I'm walking in. That's awesome. That guy has balls, let me tell you. (laughs) Anyway, that led into a conversation about dreams, where he basically told me that in his dreams, when he sleeps, he never goes unconscious. He goes fully lucid into every night for all of his dreams. He is walking consciously in all of his dreams. Isn't that crazy? These are the transformations that can happen When a person devotes their life to this stuff, uh, these are the abilities that can be unlocked. Now, these abilities can be unlocked in other ways. For instance, lucid dreaming, which is what I've just described, the ability to go into dreams fully awake, is something that can be studied without psychedelics. You can achieve that with um, a lot of practices that people have developed. And uh, over time, you can develop this ability. But I don't know if even the best lucid dreamer can be lucid all of the time through all of their dreams. Is that is that possible? Maybe you guys can tell me. I don't know. But I think it's amazing that through using this particular psychedelic, this shaman seems to have developed perfect dream lucidity. 
And I think that has something to do with the psychicness. Because as you may remember, I had a moment of psychicness through a dream with my friends. Now, I can't help but spin up theories when it comes to this stuff. And the theory I come up with for this is that dreams occur in the same place that thoughts occur. Imagination and dreams, of course, are the same thing. A dream is nothing more than a walk through your imagination, and that's the same place your thoughts happen, in your imagination. Having a clear access to this dream place allows for communication between minds, allows for sharing that place. That means that the dream space, the imagination space, the thought space, is a shared space. But maybe each of us has a different territory of it. We're all in a different sector. And maybe through practice or a gift or the use of psychedelics, we can learn to visit each other's areas. And that would be what this maestro would be doing during a ritual, is figuring out where on the map each person is and somehow traveling, somehow flying maybe up and looking down on this map of people and watching what's going on in all of the different areas. Because a maestro, as he is, can watch a group of people He can monitor a group of people in one of these ceremonies. They call them ceremonies. He can keep an eye on everyone's visions, which is exactly what he claimed on year two when I questioned him about it. He said he can see everyone's visions. Now, he proved it to me later that week without me even asking him. Uh, I had a very, very, very powerful vision Now, I'm not going to get into all the details of this elaborate vision, but it all began with the feeling that my heart was opening, was falling open onto the floor. I was on all fours, as if I was going to vomit or something, but I was feeling this, oh, oh boy, oh no, I I could feel that my heart was going to open, and I didn't want it to, because it's a very vulnerable thing, right? But there was this force that wanted to blast out of my heart, And my heart ended up just falling open. I mean, I felt a rush of energy just fall out of me and spill across the room. And what came out was, of course, beautiful things. Love and compassion and healing for everyone in the room. I was blasting that room with goodwill. But, of course, I didn't say anything about it. I was just moaning, right? And people make all kinds of sounds during these very intense ayahuasca ceremonies. So I had my moment, and my whole, it turned into a vision, and eventually the night settles down, and we all go to sleep. Now, the next morning, I look up at him when he's about to leave the door, and he looks right at me, and he points at me, and then he puts his hand on his chest, and he expands it. He goes, wah! Just, he he represents someone's heart exploding open. (laughs) How the hell, maestro? How do you know? (laughs) I could never believe it when he does this stuff, but he saw, he knew what happened to me that night. And in that moment, he proved to me what he told me at the beginning of that week, which is he can see everybody's visions, just as he saw mine that day. So, look, I could talk about this stuff forever, but are you understanding how real this is? Are you understanding how awesome this is? This is... Psychicness unlocked through psychedelic use. If you work with it long enough and work with the right systems that they have developed, they have a whole discipline developed for for becoming a shaman, for learning to work with this stuff. But it would seem that he is now psychic even outside of the influence of the drug. Because when I was at his home and he knew about the door dream, he wasn't on ayahuasca, he was just sleeping in his bed. Ah, it's amazing. I'm constantly amazed by this stuff. And it keeps me going, because I have to understand it. And it would be amazing to develop this stuff in myself, and if I ever get half a chance to train, you bet your butt I'm going to try and train. But more than that, I just want to be able to understand all of this, because this teaches us about ourselves. It teaches us about the construction of human consciousness and the landscape 
of mind. And as I said earlier, it really seems that we're sharing that place. Not only are we sharing this reality, but your thoughts, your thoughts are happening on another territory that we all inhabit. And psychicness is completely reasonable to me now. It is completely real to me now because it's the simple fact. It's the simple act of bridging two of these islands and visiting each other. You can imagine after these experiences, I went on a rampage of research about shamanism, about psychedelic use all over the world, about all of the different uh, quote-unquote miracles that have been reported through these uh, these rituals and these shamans, um, the abilities they allegedly have and whatnot. And what I found is confirmation. For example, the Aboriginal medicine men of uh, Australia, they have a sort of shaman as well. And the space that they work in, the uh, ethereal sort of um, dimension that they claim to work through, they call the dream time. See? They call it a real place. The dream time. The dream place. It all connects a world away, on the other side of the planet, is another shamanic culture that works healing and works uh, all kinds of quote-unquote magic through the dream space. In other words, the thought space. In other words, imagination. In other words, mind. It really is a landscape. And, in another place in South America, I have heard, now I don't know that much about this, but I have read about a certain culture that takes a certain type of cocoa, cocoa bean, um, a certain strain of it that is far different from what we use for chocolate, and is kind of borderline psychedelic. And what it does when they take it as a tribe is they go in a cave, they all sleep together, not sex, I mean sleep together, and they all have a communal dream to them, to this group, it's absolutely normal. There's nothing insane about it, because they live with it. It's absolutely normal to them to have a group dream. And I'm sure they confirm the details to each other in the morning. Oh yeah, I saw you in the dream, you were flying around or something. I don't know, I don't know that much about this culture. I need to do more research on it. But here again, we point to the dream place, the, the psychicness through dreams. And it gets even crazier than that, because not only do these tribes dream together as a tribe, as a frequent uh, activity, but when they have a disagreement, a clash with another tribe of the same uh, branch, they will actually, both of them, both of the tribes, will go into this ritual separately. Uh, one tribe will go to sleep with this medicine, the other tribe will go to sleep with this medicine, and they will have the war in their dreams to decide who wins the argument. And it will actually solve their problems that way. Now, wouldn't it be amazing if we can have our wars that way, instead of destroying each other in the physical world? How about just seeing who has the most imagination? How about just seeing who has the stronger ideas? That's amazing to me. They avoid bloodshed by having virtual wars in their dreams where nobody dies. Or who knows, maybe people can die. Maybe it gets that rough. I don't know. As I said, I need to do more research on this group. But here and there, all over the world, you keep hearing about plant medicines being used in the form of psychedelics, and some of them uh, not quite psychedelics, but plant medicines being used in combination with a sort of discipline that grants access to the dream time, the dream space, which then results in psychicness. There it is. So that's my report for today. That is one of the crazy things going on with uh, psychedelics. And I could just keep going on and on. I've experienced more of these. Uh, for instance, when I was in Peru on the first year, I had a very intense experience. And when I came back to Toronto at the end of that week, my dad had had a nightmare about me that matched up perfectly with the experience I had over there. The most intense moment of the experience where I thought I was going to die. He had a dream about it. 
And he didn't even know that I was over there to do psychedelics. He didn't know that I was over there to go to the jungle. I just told them, I'm going to Peru for a week. That's all they knew. So he had no clues that I would be in any kind of crazy rituals involving all kinds of visions and things like that. And he thought he just had a random bad dream about me. But no, he knew. He got a feeling of what was happening to me. Even though I didn't even try to send him that feeling, I guess it's the connection of parent and child. He didn't take any psychedelics, and yet in his dreams, he got an understanding of what was happening to me in Peru. There you go. I'm going to leave it there. There are so many mysteries highlighted through psychedelics. There are so many mysteries we can explore and understand, and it teaches us so much about the construction of reality and the human being and the human mind. I hope, I hope you guys are fascinated by this, because I absolutely am. So, as usual, you can find me on higherideas.net, where you can find the links to my Facebook, Twitter, all of those social media things. Please do share these episodes. I've got share buttons on that website for you to uh, spread the word, as it were. And of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, do subscribe, do leave a rate and a comment. Hey, maybe you can tell me if you've ever experienced any psychicness with psychedelics or what you make of these stories. Uh, if you've got an alternate explanation, I would love to see what you think. So this is I signing out and saying, until next time, fellow human, keep thinking. <laughs>